this video releases marks the 20th anniversary of this iconic game. And today's video is going to be part tour of this incredible world, visiting some of the most iconic and memorable places, as well as uh, part reminiscence on my part, uh, talking about some of my memories of this game, a game that I count among uh, my very favorites of all time, if not my number one. So, if this is your first time ever seeing Morrowind, well, I hope this gives you a little taste of what makes this game so special. And if it's not your first time, well, I hope this is a fun trip down memory lane for you. We begin our journey today at first light. The sun is rising over the misty, bitter coast, and we are in Seda Neen. Seda Neen, the swampy little village on the bitter coast, known as the gateway to Vardenfell. Vardenfell is the island on which Morrowind takes place. It is situated in the far northeast of Damriel, and it is part of the larger province of Morrowind. It's called the Gateway to Vardenfell because Satanin is where many people arrive in Morrowind, and it is where the game Morrowind begins. You arrive by ship this dock off to the right here at the census and excise office run by the Imperials. There is a significant Imperial presence in Morrowind, although less so than in other games in the series. Uh, if you hear that crackling behind us and are wondering what it's all about, that would be the signal fire, because we are situated atop of the Great Pharos, the lighthouse here in Sedanin, which is uh, sort of a, a local landmark. <laughs> it guides sailors through the inner sea and helps keep them clear of the many rocks and shoals and small islands along the Bitter Coast here. The Bitter Coast is a fetid swamp. It is uh, full of mires and, and uh, insects and uh, great gnarled trees and and smugglers abound all kinds of caves and coves to hide smuggling vessels in all up and down the coast here. Satanine is, as I said, the first location that most players, or all players of Morrowind, will encounter, necessarily so, but uh, it is just barely the tip of the iceberg when it comes to uh, the incredible diversity of locales in Morrowind. And from humble beginnings in the swamp, uh, this adventure takes us through all kinds of incredible and fantastical landscapes. And uh, I'd like to visit some of those with you today as well. Let's head on into the lighthouse. I suppose the lighthouse itself is not especially incredible or fantastical, but uh, we have to head down <laughs> to get to where we're going, so if any 
anybody is wondering. Yes, I have a lot of mods installed right now, and I will, in fact, include my mod list for real uh, down in the video description if you would like to know what mods I am running. You can find out there, and uh, you can use them yourself, of course. Uh, Morrowind is a classic and uh, it holds up in many ways today but uh, graphically is not really one of them and so uh, while what you are seeing is very close in some ways to what the game looked like all those years ago 20 years ago when it first released um, it's definitely enhanced I like to call this sort of a vanilla plus kind of look <laughs> and feel. It takes, you know, what you loved about the graphics way back then and just brings them into the modern era a little bit. I suppose the goal is to make it look like, like what I remember the game looking like back then <laughs> rather than what it actually looked like. This is a real straight house. One of the first friends you potentially make here in Morrowind is a real, the proprietor of the trade house. And he'll serve as your primary merchant upon your arrival in Satanin. That noise you hear off in the distance is the silk. Uh, a 
I believe the lore is that it was um, it was negotiated because it was part of the native Dunmer culture. It was negotiated with the imperial authorities that slavery could remain in place here. And uh, it's typically the beast races that are enslaved. The Argonians and the Khajiit. And that's a, that's a recurring theme throughout the game. As I said, this here is the Great Silt Strider. It is piloted by a native Dunmer, like this one right here. And uh, they actually pilot it by manipulating the exposed nerve endings in its hollowed out carapace, which is rather horrendous sounding. But that kind of lore is what captured my imagination as a youngster. Um, just, it's so different and so strange. They're basically giant water fleas piloted by dark elves throughout the rivers of Vardenfell. Um, and that's just one example of just the absolute wealth of bizarre and fascinating lore of this game, and when I first played this game, I just couldn't believe the depth of the lore, just how much there was, how many books there were, how, how much had been thought out, and, uh, you know, about the history of this world and setting. I had not played Arena or Daggerfall, the previous two games in the series. But, um, honestly, I think Morrowind was the first to, to go that, to go that deep <laughs> into the lore. Um, I could be mistaken about that, but we have a swampy little pool here with some insects swirling about. In the swamp there you can see the ampoule pods, which are the young growths of the draggletail plant used in all kinds of alchemical applications. This is a Kwama, a little Kwama forager. The Kwama can be aggressive, uh, but this is the, the least dangerous sort of Kwama, excepting the scribs, which are the larval form of the Kwama and are even less dangerous. They are not aggressive. There is the lighthouse just past the trees there that we began our wander at. And uh, now I think we shall leave Sadanine behind and head this way to Pelagia. That jellyfish looking creature that just slid behind the hill up there. That is a netch. The netches are floating beasts that uh, use magical sacks full of some kind of substance to stay afloat. And um, they, they roam wild through the Escadian Isles which is the area we are entering, and the Bitter Ghost. And they are farmed uh, for their leather. Netch leather is prized for its toughness. There's another road sign. So we'll head this way to Pelagiad. To Pelagiad. One element that is pretty different graphically uh, here than in the, the unmodded game. This little rat just minding his own business. Uh, one element is the view distance. In the original game, the unmodded game, you really can't see that 
far. It's very foggy, even with the view distance pushed out as far as it goes. That was due to the technical limitations of the time, of course. But it gave the game um, a unique, foggy, misty kind of ambiance. There's an ever-present fog uh, that really did lend something to the way the game felt. With modern mods and such, we are of course able to push that view distance out much further, but uh, I did still choose to retain some of that haziness, that fogginess in this modded version because it just doesn't feel right without it. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, this isn't the best place to showcase it because it's a long distance view, but yeah, as you'll see in a moment, there is quite a bit of heavy fog in the distance still. Something else that that short view distance in the original release uh, led to was a feeling that the world was bigger, I guess, than it actually is. Uh, because you couldn't really see very far, you know, from one place to the next. Um, but now, with the with the fog pushed back, it's possible to tell that uh, some places are much closer together than I than I thought, at least as a youngster. Uh, we have come now upon Pelagiad, which is an imperial settlement. Here in the Escadian Isles. The buildings demonstrate the architecture of a high rock province. And up here on the left we have the Halfway Inn. And up ahead we have Fort Pelagiad itself, which was originally constructed here by the when they first colonized the province to protect the trade routes between Sedanin, one of the major ports on the coast, as well as Vivek City, which you'll see shortly, and Balmora to the north, which uh, is one of the larger cities of the interior of Vardenfeld. Imperial presence is substantial in Morrowind, but uh, nonetheless uh, somewhat less than than other provinces. But uh, forts such as Fort Pelagiad dot the landscape of Vardenfell. Just make out those cantons in the middle. 
list. Let's uh, let's head down this way, past these stone walls. This is another thing that was not present in the original game at release. Um, that is the grass, uh, the lush fields of grass you see covering the landscape. Uh, were not present. Uh, it felt a bit more lunar, <laughs> like empty in a way, but it, again, it had its own charm. Uh, what unfortunately was present way back in 2002 uh, was this right here. This is a cliff racer, one of the most maligned creatures in all of Damriel, I reckon, but certainly in Morrowind. Cliff racers are aggressive, leathery avians, which uh, will aggro on you from, from very far away and will chase you for great distances. Uh, they are not especially dangerous, but they are so numerous that uh, one can't help but acquire a cloud of them following you uh, when you're walking along the road. And uh, they will prevent you from fast traveling and sleeping and all that stuff. They are an incredible nuisance. So much so that they became a bit of a meme. And. Uh, Later, in the lore of the Elder Scrolls, it was it was uh, added, I suppose, or retconned in that um, after the time of Morrowind, dear, uh, a character that you meet very early in the game, a fellow by the name of Jiub, he chased all the cliff racers from Vartenfell, presumably murdered them all, and in doing so gained Saint became Saint Jiub, and you can in fact encounter the spirit of Saint Jiub in Skyrim. This here is uh, a plantation that is typical of the Escadian Isles region, where we are now wandering. The Escadian Isles are uh, the agricultural hub of Varden Fell. Uh, they have rich, fertile soil, probably fertilized by the ash fall from the Red Mountain, which is the great volcano situated at the center of Varden Fell. Um, but this style of building and, uh, and this style of, of planting is very typical of this region, typically run by uh, Lalalu. Um, nobles, many Alalu, House Alalu nobles own the extensive plantations in this region. Um, owned by the nobles, but worked often by slaves, of course. Here we have uh, a cork bulb, marshmallow, salt rice, comberry, and another netch floating by over there. It's a bit of a run to Vivek from here, so why don't we uh, pick up the pace slightly. are 
generally quite docile. They're not aggressive, although they will defend themselves if attacked. Neches, in addition to their leather, are also farmed for their jelly. see if we can get a, a better view of the Temple Canton, the High Fane, and Vivex Palace. A 
as well as another feature, which is quite striking and somewhat ominous. You'll see what I mean when we get there. A central feature of Vivek is the water. There is water everywhere. The cantons are built out over the water. There is water flowing down through each canton. There are massive sewers underneath each canton. Water is certainly a central theme here. Why don't we head up? Uh, perhaps we can get yet a better view from up top. I reckon we can. Although this is pretty nice here. Isn't that pretty? Look at the statues up above. And if we move here, you can just make out a statue of Vivek himself, the warrior poet, the living god, over by the high vein. And then hanging up in the sky there, what is that? What indeed? Let's go up a little higher and see if we can get even a better view. And I'll explain to you what that is all about. This early in the morning, the cantons do seem slightly deserted, at least from the outside, but I promise you, that is far from the case. There are many individuals that call these places their, their home, or their place of work, or place of prayer. Let's head on into the Red Around Canton here. And you'll see what I mean, because there are numerous individuals that inhabit these cantons. They just don't move around much. <laughs> They're a little bit stationary. They kind of shuffle around in a little five-foot square. That down there, that is an ordinator of House Indoril. They are uh, religious warriors sworn to guard, oh, like that one right there, sworn to guard the city on behalf of Vivek and the Tribunal. Do not want to mess with the ordinators. They do not mess around. Yes, I think we ought to be able to get a much better view from up there. I love the banners hanging over the canals. manner of designs on them, script, so from up here we can get a proper look at that object looming over the temple district and the city itself, that object is the Ministry of Truth. Bardao is in fact a small moon, a moonlet, which was hurled across time and space into Nern. That is the world in which the Elder Scrolls takes place. Hurled from parts unknown, from the void perhaps. Some say it was thrown by Shiogorath himself. There are many stories around how Bar Dao arrived. No one knows the truth for sure. What is known, however, is that it floats above the city here only by the grace of Vivek, the God King, the living God, Vivek. Uh, his power keeps Bar Dao afloat, and uh, it is sure that if Vivek were to fall, or people were to stop worshipping, Vivek, that 
Bardow would crash into the city, causing a calamity of untold proportions. Um, but while Vivek is still alive and well and worshipped, he keeps it afloat with his godhood, the power of his magic. And uh, I want you to look at that, the weather is turning. We're starting to get a bit of rainfall. It's actually quite pleasant. Bardow is fading from distance there. But past, past the Ministry of Truth there, and the high fame is Vivek's palace itself, where he resides. Now the reason Bardow is called the Ministry of Truth, lightning scary, uh, is because uh, it has been hollowed out and is used as a prison for dissidents, for heretics, for those who are very loud out here, let's get inside. Uh, for those who defy the tribunal, uh, they find themselves imprisoned within the floating moon of Bardow. It's a very good place for a prison because you can only access it by levitating. It's pretty hard to get into it or out of it without I the means to levitate. So this is the upper level of the Red Ren Canton. And uh, there are some manor houses built into the Canton here. Also uh, many uh, more luxurious shops and merchants ply their wares, set up shop on the upper levels of the Cantons. As one might suspect, as one goes lower in the Cantons, the occupants become less affluent. Let's see if it's still raining out there. Oh, it very much still is. Let's see, can we spy? Mm, just barely. Can you see? Over this way, just through the rain and the fog. You can just make out the faint outlines of Ebonheart. Ebonheart is the seat of imperial power here in Varden Fell. And um, it sits just adjacent to Vivek here on Narvain Bay. It's also the seat of the East Empire Company, which is a state-sponsored trading company of the Imperials that has a substantial presence here in Morrowind. I do believe we will visit Ebonheart, but not just yet. I think we'll save that for later. of the coastal settlements of 
part in the film. But I think we should take a silt strider. The silt striders are the best way to reach the interior of the province. And I think we ought to visit Balmora, because Balmora is certainly one of the most iconic places in Morrowind. So, let us, let us uh, jump on into this overgrown water flea and uh, head inland to Balmora. And here we are in Balmora. Balmora is the seat of House Halalu here in Vardenfell. House Halalu is an influential dark elf great house. Oh, would you look at that? It looks like the rain followed us. <laughs> uh, an influential dark elf great house, uh, largely of, of merchants and politicians. is a fairly mercantile city. It's divided by the river o Odai. Gosh, that was loud. The river Odai, which flows through the middle here. And divides the city into two major districts. We have the, the trade, or the commercial district here on the west side of the Odai River. And I, I actually forget the name of the district on the east side there. It might be the Layman's district or something. I, I can't remember exactly. But um, unsurprisingly, the commercial district over here has all manner of shops and services. And then up above, there's the high city. Up those stairs, which is home to many of the Halalu councilmen and nobles, as well as the, uh, the more well-to-do merchants. We'll go take a quick peek. other parts. 
parts of Varden film. Let's speak with this nice lady here. And uh, she will see us off to our next port of call, which is not a literal port, but our next city stop, which is Old Run. And here we are, just like that, at the Old Run Mages Guild. It's a very handy service, isn't it? Old Run is yet further into the interior of Vardenfell. In fact, it it hugs the ghost fence, which is a great magical wall built around the Red Mountain to keep out the ash storms and the blight, which is a terrible disease that emanates from the massive volcano. Uh, it does a better job of some things than others. There are still massive ash storms that rack the interior wastes of Vardenfell, but the blight is generally confined within the ghost fence. Certainly the, the corporous beasts are mostly confined within the ghost fence. Um, Aldrin, where we find ourselves now, is a fascinating city. It is the seat of House Red Oran, which is another one of the great houses here in Morrowind. Uh, it is a fairly stern kind of house, a house of warriors, mostly. Uh, pious warriors. And actually you can see up the, the mountainside there, that is the ghost fence, that magical barrier winding its way over the hills. In case you've been wondering what that, uh, that sort of fog emanating from the bottom of the screen is, that's, that's our breath. <laughs> that uh, indicates that it's a bit chilly out, I suppose. One of the most striking features of all the run is this right here. This is the massive, massive shell of a prehistoric emperor crab, once named Scar, and many of the administrative uh, offices, as well as the, the better off merchants, um, are found sheltering within, underneath, this massive shell, and uh, it is so named Under Scar uh, because it's under the shell of Scar, <laughs> this primordial beastly crab. Let's go take a peek at Under Scar, shall we? So, this is the interior of the crab shell. Like I said, the uh, individuals of House Red Aran are virtuous, noble, but stern warriors. They tend to be fairly pious as well. They are fairly closely aligned with the tribunal and they partake in the guarding and defense of the ghost fence. You can see many shops and offices have been burrowed into the walls of this great shell. Fascinating, isn't it? I think that's simply 
just the style perhaps built um, you know in the image of uh, the great shell of Scar we were lucky in that we arrived in Old Run Old Run pardon me um, when it is clear or relatively clear at least um, a lot of the time here it's ash storming where you see all kinds of sand and ash getting kicked up by a, a wicked wind whipping through the streets the ash storms can be quite unpleasant but uh, it looks like we managed to escape them here today here's the mage's guild uh, where we arrived we're going to take advantage of their services once again use that same teleporter which brought us here to take us somewhere different yet again you recall I was mentioning the Telvanni mages earlier the Telvanni are one of the other great houses of Morrowind and the Telvanni Dunmer are uh, well known for being great mages being quite egotistical as well <laughs> let's go visit the Telvanni shall we this uh, helpful elf will help us no doubt welcome to the Sadrith Mora Mages Guild situated in Wolverine Hall which is an imperial fort uh, we are now on the far east coast of Vardenfell and uh, this is the domain of the Delvani now like I said you won't find any Delvani mages here in the mages guild because being ancient and incredibly powerful the Delvani mages tend to disdain the common uh, magic users of the mages guild the Delvani themselves um, are situated in great towers that are very different architecturally from anything we've seen thus far let's go visit a Delvani tower you'll see what I mean when we get there about them being very different. Wolverine Hall here is a bit of a warren. Finding your way around can be a little tricky. But uh, I do believe. Oh gosh, where are we now? Uh -huh. I think this is where we want to go. Indeed, it is. We find ourselves outside Wolverine Hall which as you can see is built in the traditional imperial style this is an imperial stronghold here amongst the Telvanni one of the very few for that matter the Telvanni don't really welcome visitors so much <laughs> they can be very aloof that just over there you can see a little bit a little teaser of what the Delvani have going on here like the Ascadian Isles giant mushrooms can be found scattered throughout this region further inland mushrooms give way to rolling plains and savanna trees in the grazelands but out here on the coast it's all about the fungus and not just in the natural landscape because the Delvani structures are in fact grown from these enormous fungi into all kinds of shapes and sizes for various purposes they grow in a sort of a fairy ring, if you will, around a great 
the central tower, which we can see just up there. These mushrooms are grown with magic through the power of the mighty Delvani wizards. They shape them into whatever they need. Homes, taverns, shops, these sorts of things. Delvani wizards, for all their egocentrism, are in fact quite powerful. They are great magic users, and many of them live for centuries. They are also accomplished academics and researchers into the arcane arts. And their structures make for quite the sight, don't they? Sadrith Mora, which is the settlement in which we find ourselves now, is the seat of House Tolvani here in Vardenfell. And of course, the great wizard himself lives up in his great tower, presiding over all that happens in Sadrith Mora. I believe the arch wizard of Sadrith Mora is Neloth. Neloth. And this is his tower. We're not going to head into Neloth's tower right now because, well, truth be told, to traverse it, we would need to be more magical than we are. Delvani Wizards towers are best navigated using oh, where are we going to go here? I'm trying to find our way down. Uh, best navigated using levitation. There are many vertical passageways that require the use of levitation. These great stone doors are also characteristic of Delvani settlements. This Delvani guard appears to be having some serious problems with the door, however. Let's help them out. <laughs> no, they're still struggling. That's okay. I would like to go visit the Grayslands further inland, but I think we're going to have to save that for another video because there's just so much to see and this has already gone on quite some time more giant fungi and vines growing in the distance let's board a boat and head to the final settlement which we're going to visit is going to be one that we already saw from a distance. The Imperial Seat of Ebenhart back down on the south coast of Vardenfell, adjacent to Vivek City. We'll talk to this fellow and get him to take us there. And just like that, it's so hello, sir. space G. Just like that, it is daytime again. We traveled through the night to arrive in Ebenhart, which, as I said, is the, the center of imperial power here in Vardenfell. We have a great statue of Akadosh, presumably, here in the town square, striking quite a dramatic pose way up 
perhaps it brought back some great memories of when this game came out all those years ago, those two decades. Uh, if you would like to see more of Morrowind, if you would like to see more of Wind, I do stream Morrowind on Twitch quite regularly. Um, you know, every couple of weeks or so we'll jump back into our save game and uh, carry on through because as you have seen and as I have said, there is so much to see and to do. We have barely scratched the surface here. And I would love to have you join us at twitch.tv slash the ASMR nerd. I stream every Sunday night right now uh, in the evenings around 8.30 p.m. Pacific time. You can find a link down below this video and it would be my pleasure to see you there. I will in fact be streaming Morrowind the evening that this video releases. Uh, to celebrate, of course, the 20th anniversary of the game. So, if you happen to be watching this on the day of release, well, <laughs> perhaps I will be live over on Twitch. That link, once again, down below in the video description. Okay, I've said plenty. <laughs> I've talked too much. Uh, thank you again for joining me on this journey, this adventure here today. And I look very forward to having you back here next time. Farewell for now, my friends.